Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, Senior Science Fellow and Principal Atmospheric Scientist for Nutrient Ag Solutions. And uh, here we are on October the 6th, and this forecast video is for Farm Credit Illinois as we look out to the rest of fall and get a sneak preview of winter. So let's dig into it. The first map you've been looking at here shows you from September the 5th to October the 6th what the precipitation ranks per climate district look like. Now we got 130 years in the data set, so the closer you are to 130, the drier. Now you can see that coming out of Illinois into Missouri, getting down here along the Mississippi River Basin, then farther to the west into parts of the Mid-South and South, things have been very dry. The jet stream pattern has favored an upper level trough that sat here earlier in the month of September that moved through. There's been a lot of pull on moisture coming up through the desert Southwest, but overall we've seen broad ridging. That's high pressure sitting in this area for quite some time. Now because of that, we've seen some wide open harvest windows, but things have gotten pretty dry. Just looking back at the last 30 days, this map shows you percent of normal. I want to give you that whole perspective of the United States just to show you how dry it has been, not only in and around a lot of farm credits territory here, but around the rest of the Corn Belt, getting down here into parts of the Mid-South and the Southern Plains. In fact, some of the rain that you see right in through here was actually just from one event earlier in the month. So we've had a very dry midsection of the country. We've avoided tropical cyclones that could come up the Mississippi River and be very disruptive. And the biggest one we've had to discuss was Ian, which came across Florida and then eventually came into the Carolinas. So we've seen a lack of tropical cyclone activity despite forecasts of being uh, above normal in terms of activity. We've had large ridges that have protected us uh, and opened up harvest windows. And to be honest, this is some of the longest harvest windows I've seen in a while. So we got some questions. How long does it last? What's going to control this pattern going forward? What do the temperatures look like? And what about a little bit of an international update? So let's cover that today, okay? First, our next 15 days continues to favor more drier days than wetter days. And when moisture does come through, we're really struggling to tap into a lot of late season Gulf moisture that can come right up the gut of the Mississippi and deliver a lot of rain. So we are still watching systems roll through the country in fronts like we normally get in October. But because of that lack of moisture, we just don't see them producing above normal rainfall for a broad section here in the United States. So those dry conditions we've seen for the last 30 days, we expect the soils to stay dry going forward, which means we're going to continue to see very favorable harvest weather in terms of precipitation. Now, um, overall, this dry weather will increase the threat of having um, field fires, so we need to be very careful with respect to that, but I know we always are. Uh, and as we just watch this larger picture evolve, this is something we want to see gone by the time we're in the next spring, right? So in the near term, let's flip our uh, script over to talking about temperatures because just as I started recording this on Thursday afternoon, the front passed. So that's the leading edge of the cooler air we're getting here at the end of this first week of October. There's a big dome of high pressure that's sitting over parts of Manitoba coming into the Dakotas and some of the cooler air behind this is 20 to 30 degrees cooler than it has been. And what's going to happen as this front, front advances on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this weekend, that would be the 7th, 8th, and 9th, we're going to be seeing our chances for some frost. So this map shows uh, the frost extent over the next seven days, and we're going to see high potential across a lot of farm credits territory here. Maybe right there on I-70 could be a break, but I've been getting reports that even in southern Illinois, we had some early season frost already hit some fields. So for many, this is going to be the first frost event, uh, but for some that might skip out on it, we might see you know, several days between this one and the next one. Because the temperature pattern over the next five days, all right, that's where that high pressure cell slides through and we are cooler. But we're going to try to warm back up after we get into early next week while much of the heat stays west. You see the day five through 10 starts to show that rebound in temperature. We always get that in the fall. We get this nice rebound in temperatures. But overall, the jet stream wants to favor as we get out there toward the middle, maybe the third week of October, more flow that's doing something a bit like this. And therefore, we could be ushering in some cooler weather earlier this fall once we get past the next few weeks here. Now, the big news in terms of what we need to be covering for the rest of fall and really have a discussion about the rest of the globe isn't the winds coming out of Canada. It's these winds right here. That is the nose of the trade winds going across the Pacific. So you see Australia, Indonesia, now you got yourself oriented. These trade winds right here along the equator are very strong compared to normal. And that is what the atmosphere does when it's in a state of La Nina. And one of the big questions I want to answer at the end of this video is, this La Nina, which has just continued to be so very strong throughout summer of 2022 and now into fall, in fact, it's been strengthening over the last 45 days. We have questions as to how long this continues to dominate the flow. 
because what La Niña's can typically do to our weather in winter and in fall is we tend to get a drier and cooler fall, but then we also see a very wet winter across the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley. So is this going to stick around? Well, all of our major global models agree with what I'm going to show you here from NOAA. This is their model called the CFS V2, Climate Forecasting System Version 2. This is the average temperature line for a place called Nino Region 3.4. That is right here, the center of the Pacific. And what you notice is they're expecting La Nina to maintain its strength, maybe even get a little stronger through October and early November. But by the time we start 2023, nearly every global forecast model is projecting a fade back toward what we call inso-neutral conditions, where those ocean temperatures are right there closer to normal. Now remember, the ocean temperature change is the symptom. The cause is the shift in the trade winds. So that's going to be the number one thing to be watching. When do these stop blowing so hard out of the east? That will be the first thing to start to crumble. As it stands, this is how things shape up uh, from mid-October to mid-November. As I said, we have some drier weather now through the second week and maybe even a little bit into the third week of October. But after that, the jet stream starts to pull into the Pacific Northwest. It tends to run across the northern tier of the United States, which means we could see those later harvest windows starting to close up on us as we get out of October and into November. So that's the first thing. The second thing that we're going to ask about La Nina is, this is what our current drought monitor looks like. This was just updated today on the 6th when I'm recording this. And you can still see extensive drought throughout the midsection of the country. And we do have a big portion here of Illinois and Indiana that still have drought as well. Now, when we talk about the positioning of La Nina and its strength, it is really a discussion about rainfall delivery across North America. That's what we're concerned about. So let's show you what we've got. The La Nina through fall, again, we favor earlier some drier days, but take a look at this. If this is the October, November, December outlook on precipitation anomalies, much of this is driven by the October dryness. But when you incorporate November, December, January, we're now seeing a very typical La Nina pattern. The jet stream likes to enter into the Northwest like this and then run along this path and out of the Ohio River Valley. That tends to leave a big section of the United States across the South very dry. Now what we're seeing though is the middle of winter, December, January, February, this is almost textbook La Nina pattern. But remember, it's after this point that I start to see the La Nina fading. And that fade generally means that we tend to develop a stronger subtropical branch of the jet that comes in like this to complement the polar branch of the jet that sits like that. So what you now notice is that going into the heart of winter and really the second half of it, Nearly every forecast model has the state of Illinois, the Ohio Valley, the Tennessee Valley, the Mississippi Valley, wetter than normal. And it continues that all the way out into February, March, and April. So we're going to have big question marks. How tight could those windows be next year if that subtropical jet forms and starts to slow down our planting progress? The good news about this is that if the forecast I just shared with you, which was brand new today, okay, brand new data released today, if it verifies, we're really going to shrink that drought area up in a big way. What I'm concerned about, though, is that La Niñas, when they start off in the winter, tend to be a bit unkind with temperatures through the middle of winter. And we see the December, January, February outlook favoring more cold air outbreaks coming out of the north across the state of Illinois, while the southwest and the southeast are tending to stay a bit warmer. So we're going to just keep an eye on those temperature patterns as well as we go forward. The other thing La Niña is going to have effect on is South America. The start of the planting season will be fast in central and northern Brazil. They're already well ahead of normal planting pace. But Argentina is struggling with drought. Pockets of southern Brazil have seen some droughts. Same with Paraguay and Uruguay. And as we play forward, take a look. November, December, January. December, January, February. We see southern Brazil and Argentina still showing up with issues. Where there could be problems if the La Nina lets go in the middle of our winter, their summer, is that late in the year, like January, February, March, we could be talking about some issues here on the way the soybean crop finishes and then on how the safrina corn crop goes in. Those are two big competing crops with Illinois crops. So South America is going to be a major wild card. As I said, fast start, issues south. We need to see how this all changes with the fading La Nina. Very quickly, some other places around the world we continue to see major drought stress in southeast China. That's going to be a story that lasts all through winter. Take a look at this. And if that continues all the way through winter and still shows up next spring, 
that's going to be something that could have a major impact on global markets. And one other thing to think about would be Europe. Now, let's just take you to, I don't know, January, February, and March, and let's not look at precipitation, but instead look at temperatures. And if we look out there at the seasonal temperature anomalies, you're going, okay, I don't see too much. What you see here, though, is that the model is showing near normal winter temperatures. And the thing about a near normal winter is that you do get colder outbreaks. And given how fragile the energy situation is, especially in Western Europe, if we do have significant cold air outbreaks this winter, this could really drive global demand of some of the important inputs into ag, like natural gas. Lastly, I'm just going to let you know something. I know we've been looking at winds here, but if we take a step out and look right down on top of the North Pole and zoom back in, the thing I'll be watching most carefully all winter is how these winds orbit. Those winds there are part of the polar vortex. And as we see the polar vortex set up this year, some of the big questions we're going to have are what's going on with the ocean temperatures in and around the Chukchi Sea, the Bering Sea, the Arctic, the North Atlantic and North Pacific, which could control the strength of the vortex, letting it weaken at times, really delivering some cold air. So we've got a lot on our plate. Enjoy the open harvest windows when you've got them, but be prepared for those to close up tightly here very soon. But with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I hope you all have a good harvest season and we slide into winter without too much to talk about. Thanks.